Hey guys, it's been a long time since I've posted anything, and it's not for lack of action. We've actually been crazy busy. We made it into the final round for the Hackaday Prize, which is super exciting. And so I've been kind of just running on lock, getting as much of this done as possible, including we did like a one week camping trip to Hawaii, where we did like a third iteration on some of the buoys. It was really intense. We were camping out in state campgrounds. And of course, like nothing went right technically. So I was just kind of like living out of my tent and then working out of a park bench and then putting stuff in the water whenever we could. We still had one big missing uh, deliverable for the project, which was a buoy using a custom platform, something you could source from Home Depot. So you don't have to be, you know, next to an old supply of these fad buoys to build, build our project. Um, and we also still hadn't done any captures with the water quality probes. Uh, so we went for the two for one, we put the water quality probes in the, uh, what I'm calling the pipe buoy. And we actually got that out for three days, which was unprecedented for us to actually get the buoy in the water and like leave it in the ocean for three days straight. It's very nerve wracking, especially when we have so much time invested. Yeah, so I'm going to get that footage out as quickly as I can. However, I just wanted to start going over some of these other design, design decisions we're making after the fact. So one of the big factors was power management. So we had three days worth of data, or we should have had three days worth of data, but we don't actually have a really great way to schedule power for the buoy. So for example, if we're doing uh, video footage, right, you don't want to be uh, recording all through the night. So since the buoy has a cell modem in it, we could fetch like the sunrise time, and then program our power manager, the power manager board to wake us up at sunrise. Uh, like in the case of maybe the hydrophone, there are certain marine mammals that are like, their location is very like tidal based off of the tides. Uh, so you, maybe you could fetch your local tides and then say, okay, at high tide or at the incoming high tide, come on in and wake me up. And then for like simpler things like the water quality management, you know, it still would be useful just to say, okay, every hour, wake up take these five readings, go back to sleep. Okay, so I'm just quickly going over our big design requirements. Our first one is to be able to schedule power, you know, in real time. And by real time, I mean like clock dates, right? If we're trying to make things, make decisions based off tides, sunrises, that sort of thing, this needs to be calendar dates, you know, not like an arbitrary number of like Arduino clock cycles. So that was a big one for us. The other one is we needed a way to monitor our input power. So if you're powering this off a battery in the field for a long period of time, you know, it's entirely possible you'll get to a point where the battery is dead or near dead and you want to schedule or turn it off entirely. In the case of the recycled buoys, uh, we're going to have solar power coming in, but you still want to know if you're close to dead so you can schedule a nice long turn off and come back online when you're, when you're fully juiced. Our final design requirement is we wanted it to run on a coin cell, or at least on its own isolated power supply. Um, right, this shouldn't be taxing the, the main battery anymore. It should work kind of independently of that. Um, yeah, so it really doesn't put any extra burden on the system. It draws very little power anyway, but that was, that was something we wanted. But basically, it has an external real-time clock that has a programmable interrupt. And rather, so I don't want to use like a microcontroller uh, at all because having like another programmable device for the system really just adds a lot of overhead. Um, and these real-time clocks seem that they could be pre-configured for it if we just thought about our circuit a little bit. And so that's what we're going to be testing out today. The reason I didn't want to use a microcontroller circuit for all this is I don't really like the idea of introducing another processor into the system. It's more firmware, it's more overhead, it's more power profiling. You know, you got to like manage the memory of the microcontroller while also managing its sleep modes. It includes like its own peripherals. Um, and it just, I think it just is more complexity than it's really needed. Yeah, so that's the overall purpose for the device. So let's kind of just get into uh, how it works. And then we can talk about some of the design, design factors that went into it. And here's our, our schematic. Uh, this is the top level schematic. And so there's really not too much to see. These are all connectors, different ways to connect batteries. These are like debug pins. And then here's our Raspberry Pi pins. 
So basically, the core circuit is all of this. Uh, and this boils down to three simple components. This is a current and voltage monitor to monitor the input from our battery, so the voltage level of the battery and how much current we're drawing. So we can start to kind of put together like real estimates of battery life. We have a switching regulator and then the power timer circuit. And this is kind of the bulk of the, of the design. Essentially, we just have this real-time clock, and it's a DS3231. And they're incredibly stable. They're not the cheapest on the market, but they work great. And the thing that's good about this is it has this interrupt pin. So we can program in an alarm that will trigger an interrupt at a real-time value. So once we configure the time for the clock, we can say, okay, like, uh, at sunrise this morning, like, wake up the whole system. But there's one tricky thing about this. There's a couple tricky factors. The big one is, is that the interrupt is active low. So it idles high, and then when the system is supposed to be asleep, and then when the alarm triggers, it drops low. So what we have to do here is just put it through a, a just, just an inverter. Uh, then the other thing is, when you set the clock, or when this interrupt triggers, you know, at a certain point, you're going to have to issue an I squared C command that says, okay, like, shut down the system. And in the case of the Raspberry Pi, it does shut down very quickly, and you can kind of just pull the plug on them. But we wanted to have the chance to actually do, like, a clean shutdown. Uh, and there is options in the Raspberry Pi kernel to execute a GPIO change at shutdown, like, right when it's going off. Uh, so we just run it through this other OR gate so the Raspberry Pi can also put in a, a power hold. I'm calling it a power hold. Uh, so when the Pi comes online, it puts this line high and says, okay, like the power is going to stay on while I'm holding this line high. And then it can reprogram the RTC, uh, you know, set new alarms, reset the, the previous alarm. So this can actually safely go low without losing power to the whole system. And then when the Pi shuts down, it automatically pulls this, uh, this line low. So that's, that's the core of it. There's a few other risky factors. The first one is that when the DS3231 comes online for the first time, this just acts as a one hertz square wave. Now, if you program it a single time to not, with, with the new behavior you want, this will go away. However, uh, you know, you still are going to want an option, at least for the first programming, or if your battery ever dies, to manually turn on the whole system, uh, you know, despite what may be happening here. So here we see on the output, on the enable output of our whole circuit, uh, we have like a little switch, just so you can ride the whole, override this whole thing and turn on your Pi. Other little details, there's a lot to get right here. You know, we just want to have minimal leakage current because uh, all of these components need to be powered by uh, a little battery, like a little uh, coin cell battery. And that's this uh, battery two here on the circuit. So that feeds straight into our real-time clock. But then, of course, we want all this external logic to work as predicted. Uh, it needs to feed into our, our logic gates and so forth. These are also drawing from the CRT battery. Uh, these are like very low uh, current devices. I think we're talking like 10 microamps tops. If not, like, we'll double check the data sheets. It might be closer to four. Um, so, but we are powering them from that same little RTC. Um, and then when this device is actually online, we don't really want to power from that little battery we want the power to come from uh, the 3.3 volt rail that we'd power off of normally. Uh, so we have another diode here. So hopefully that all works as expected. So I think that this is pretty dang clever and it's gonna do a lot for us. You know, it's not gonna put any burden on your system. The majority of the burden on your personal battery is gonna come from your switching regulator. Quescent, quescent, whatever the quescent current is of your switching regulator is gonna determine how much of a burden current you're putting on your battery when it's asleep. Um, so this is just kind of like whatever your budget allows for. And this is where we kind of get into the big trade-offs of the design. So then the, the big thing is actually like connectivity. So there's like a couple different ways you could build this, right? 
It could just be the simple, like, here's our, our real-time clock. It could just be the real-time clock with just, like, a place to plug in any switching regulator and, like, generic power output pins and, like, screw terminals for input pins, right? And so you can use it on a Raspberry Pi, use it on a microcontroller or whatever, you know, but for the case of our pipe buoy, we actually are kind of constrained on space. And I think it's more important to have something that works very well in our system than in every generic system. I know that there are people who disagree with me, but I think we still haven't lost that here. Uh, you know, we can maybe make one that had everything on their own screw terminals, but we still have like through hole debug headers for everything. So this is like your I squared C and power hold and 3.3 volts. Here you can do a test voltage for the uh, coin cell battery. Here, these, these connectors are for LiPo balance leads, because you don't really need a ton of current to run this thing. Okay, let's actually just demo this system now. Here you can see I have it laid out. Uh, I have this uh, Nordic Power Profiler Kit. They're like $100. Um, it's the most cost-effective way I know to do a power profile like this. So that's what we're going to roll with. Basically, it samples, you know, I think it's hundreds of kilohertz. And we can add a, a voltage to simulate our battery and see how much current we're drawing. And the battery we're going to simulate is this little uh, coin cell. And we have a, a jumper for it right here. And there's no coin cell in here. Nothing under my hand, nothing under my sleeves. This just plugs onto the Raspberry Pi. No problems. We won't screw it on now since we're going to put this coin cell back in. And then since I am uh, connecting this thing over the cell modem, I'm just going to plug the cell modem back in. And then lastly, here's our big old battery pack. Nice, that's a pretty tidy little setup. So what we're going to do is just turn our board on with this bypass switch. Hopefully you can see those LEDs go on. And we're going to take a look here. We'll set our coin cell to 3.1 volts. That's on, and we'll start recording. And we're just drawing nothing right now. And that's to be expected because when the 3.3 volt regulator is on, uh, the that is powering the whole system except for the battery backup on the on the real-time clock itself. So we really do expect this to idle at zero. <laughs> Sorry, let's actually power cycle this thing and see how our system behaves. So I'm just gonna SSH in, ignore my password. And then this is just our little uh, test script. So we're not like uh, integrating this into like our bigger network config yet. Um, but you can see that here we're putting it to sleep for uh, 60, so 60 seconds for 60, 60 times. So this would be an hour, but let's just go ahead and set this to one minute. Okay, the big thing you can get wrong here is if you don't uh, switch this back to auto, it'll have no hope of waking itself back up when it shuts down. Um, I'm hoping there's a way to detect that. I might get like a single pole double throw switch so we have a quick way to verify we're in the right position, but that's just something you gotta do. And uh, in the script, I do put in a reminder to do that. <laughs> but here we go, we're gonna shut down. And you'll see, here's our set wake up time. You know, which is should be in exactly a minute. 54, it's 3.53. And we just saw the LEDs flicker off. And so now we can take a look at our power profile here. And we should see this going up a little bit. There we go. We can see we're drawing 2.2 and a quarter microamps, two and a half microamps on average. Uh, so that's going really great. And just to maybe prove, you know, that we're not accidentally back powering something from this uh, LiPo, when we unplug the LiPo, uh, we still get the same, we still get the same current drop. 
So we don't want like sneakily drawing it from this lipo. The other thing that's great about this is we can actually just like all the way unplug this. Uh, maybe we won't do that now, but we could. We could all the way unplug this, take this whole thing apart, and this is all running self-contained on its own. So it is like a very isolated supervisor system. And we're just gonna come straight back online since I pulled it out during our, uh, and here you can see the voltage drop, the power consumption drop. So, I mean, two and a quarter microamps, two and a half microamps, 200 milliamp hour battery on the coin cell here. So we're really in good shape. You know, I think you have years of battery power off that. So we haven't mangled, you know, the beautiful low power functionality of our real time clock with all of our little logical outputs. And this works completely without another microcontroller. So I think we're in a sweet spot.